This is The John Tegg Show, an actor's odyssey and more. I am your host, John Tegg. Give me a follow on Instagram and Twitter. My handle is at John J. Tegg. That's at J-O-H-N-J-T-A-G-U-E. Drop me a message, give me a follow, I'd love to hear from you. This episode is brought to you by the Rolling Soldier Digital Web Series, a psychological web series about a CIA agent on the run with what is left of his team and family. Available on YouTube and Facebook. Check it out. And Rising Lotus Yoga, with yoga studios available in Sherman Oaks and Newhall, California. Let joy rise. www.risinglotusyoga.com and www.risinglotusyogascv.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's John Tegg, and this is the John Tegg Show. And today I'm really excited to have my good friend Eddie Jemison on the show. What's up, Eddie? Hey, John. Thanks hey, for been? having me. Oh, man. Are you kidding? This is, uh, this is my pleasure, man. Um, this is been? the only thing I've done for months. That I know. makes me even remind myself that I once acted. I know. It's so it's so crazy that that um everyone's been so shut down and there's nothing happening. Have you have you been doing any kind of um you haven't done any uh like self tapes or anything like that or any uh, nobody's requested anything? No, in fact, I've been reduced to like emailing people I've worked with before and asking them myself like hey can i get is there a part for me in this or are you doing anything and i just, i've there's nothing that i know about i know it's it's uh it's super frustrating i put myself on tape for one thing for i think it was yellowstone the other day and that's been it literally but you know? still that's good yeah but i mean are they are they ever going to get around to shooting that's the thing you know didn't you have several jobs that you were about to do? Yeah. Yeah. Right I had like, when this hit? I had four things lined up that were oh gonna start God. that were gonna start shooting in April. And oh all God. of them have been pushed back and I have no idea if they're gonna if they're gonna, you know, continue or not. I, I don't know. It, it, they sound like, you know, they're they're gonna try to make them, but but it's in limbo. For but that. it's in limbo, and, and and it seems like everything is like with these new guidelines and everything. Everything seems so um, so crazy. Like I I keep I keep looking at these guidelines, wondering how are they going to get anything done? Have you have you checked them out? Have you looked at them? No, I've only heard about them. So you you'll have to educate me. Well, all they, I know, John, is that I was having a hard time before this hit. Mm. You know, being an actor in general is is a lot of waiting around and yeah and and living in limbo yeah totally this is even crazier because at least you had the possibility of working which is like hard enough to live with yeah just the possibility but when you take that out you've got nothing left tell me about these guidelines well basically i i looked over the sag guidelines and i also looked over the commercial con the commercial guidelines and basically the gist of it is they're going to break everything down into three zones there's like yeah. the, the a zone the b zone and the c zone or, or the one two and three zones or whatever they're calling them okay and they're going to stagger lunches and they're going to you know basically if you're not if you're not uh talent or like a key you know head of a department or whatever yeah you're you're only allowed in that one specific zone everybody else has to stay out of those zones so that means like you know all the like the caterers and the, and the grips and and all all the you know all the guys that really make shit happen they're going to be like it's going to be like this weird staggered thing that they have to do and mm -hmm. the testing and, and all that that's going to go on just seems like it just seems bonkers but I, you know i'm I it look seems at, like really difficult sorry go ahead no, no, well i was going to say that you know, like I, I look at it and i'm just curious as to how they're going to make their days uh, and, uh, so, and it seems like everything's going to have to like, it seems like the shooting days are going to be doubled because I, I just don't understand how they're going to, you know, if suppose you've got like five or six pages to shoot or like 10 pages. Yeah. I don't know how they, I don't know how they're going to do that. You know, but, but just for, you know, to play devil's advocate, <clears throat> you know, when I worked with Soderbergh, mm -hmm. those crews were generally about, almost half the size as normal crews were or maybe not the crew wasn't half the size but the amount of people 
on set working to make the operation happen was generally so much smaller than what you usually see. Yeah. And those are pretty big movies. So yeah. it's there's a lot of excess anyway. How many and people you know would you I, how many people would you say were on a Soderbergh crew? Gosh, it's been a while. I would say fifteen. Yeah. Compared to like a hundred on like a show like The Blacklist or something like that. I mean like you mentioned like in the room at the time while you're shooting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what I mean. There are many more people, obviously. Yeah. Working. But and even when I did my own film, I think we had three crew members. I was one. Yeah. And we, we made our days. Yeah, man. Yeah. There's I, a lot of excess that that can be scaled back. I think so too. However, I, I hate the fact of people losing their jobs. I know I that's, that. that's the thing, you know, um, I mean, hopefully they can find some other thing for them to do where, you know, they're not going to lose their jobs. But anyway, you know, we, we can go on and on about this, but I wanted to talk, I wanted to talk about you, sir. I wanted to let my, my audience know about you and if they already know who you are, because it's... you, are, you are, you've done so many things and you're one of those guys that, you know, I love you to death because you're a fantastic person and you're a great actor. I'm not so sure that's coming through. I just I just called for a cut in everybody's jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and this isn't going well for me. We just no, started. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You you're didn't call to, for anybody. You're trying to make me sound like this great guy, and I'm saying, no, you are. oh, we can cut half the jobs. Well, you know. I don't even know what I'm talking about, John. I know. Like, to be honest, I can barely remember what happened in those Soderbergh movies. Yeah, neither do I. It seemed like there were a lot fewer people there. Yeah, but for sure. On. But anyway, but let's, let's let's talk about you. Let's talk <laughs> about I want to uh, let's let's kind of give the quick brief rundown of Eddie Jamison. Eddie, where where did you grow up, man? I grew up in New Orleans, mm -hmm. Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Um, started acting in high school because you know, I really wanted to play baseball, but I was too small to make the team and I was pretty bad. Me too, man. I mean, I played baseball through high school. Yeah, and I played till I was 15, and I really wanted to play. And I went to a really, it was a major sports kind of school. Mm -hmm. But um, I couldn't cut it. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, oh, maybe I'll be a cheerleader. It, that And even that seemed like humiliating. And I couldn't even make <laughs> that. Right. So the next thing, I knew I had to do something. Because I just felt I had to do something. Yeah, and so I tried acting, and uh, it just sort of clicked. And what was it? What was it about it that attracted you to it? I think because I lived in my imagination so much as a mm. kid, it was natural for me to pretend to be other people. Also, I wasn't so fond of who I was as I was, so uh, pretending I was someone else seemed like a relief from me. Yeah, there's something about stepping into you know somebody else's skin that is intriguing and, and like appealing. I, I know I feel that way a lot of the times. Would you say you're kind of a shy person at I think, heart? I think I was shy growing up. You know, I was shy like all through high school. Like I, I couldn't get a date. I couldn't, I mean, it was bad. And yeah, the only, I, nobody started noticing me until I slung a guitar around my shoulder. Mm -hmm. then my life kind of changed and, you know, and I started out with music and then I went into acting, um, mm -hmm. kind of through osmosis, I guess, in college. But, um, so when you were first starting out, you, were you doing plays in high school or were you doing kind of like community theater stuff? What, what was going on? I was, so I was doing plays in high school mm -hmm. and it was an all boys school. Oh, really? So it was an all boys Catholic school in New Orleans, which is kind of, uh, there's plenty of them because sure. it's such a Catholic town. Yeah. And so it was the one way also to meet girls, you mm. know. Oh, because they, they would bring girls in from other schools to do the play? Yeah, like the Catholic oh, girls school was the sister cool. school. Mm. And not that I was good with girls or anything, but it was just a relief from 
a school full of boys to finally have just this other perspective, you know, sure. yeah. just to hang, be around girls yeah. was, a, was a relief, you know? Was it a good program? Were they like on top of things? Were they, was it kind of known for being a theater program? No, it wasn't. It, but it was a great program because it was so small. We had two classrooms mm -hmm. that we turned into a theater and it was such a tiny little place underfunded that we got to do whatever we wanted and we had to focus more on plays whereas the bigger better schools with the known programs they did musicals mostly because mm. they had to have big productions and we were you know small and mighty so we got to do cooler things much cooler things yeah yeah do you remember any of the plays that you did <laughs> We did Inherit the Wind. Oh, wow. That's pretty uh, hardcore for a uh, Catholic school. Yeah, it was pretty. It, I guess so, yeah. I mean, you think about um, it. You know, the other usual things like uh, Mousetrap, uh, Barefoot in the Park, stuff well, like wow, that. So it was, it was pretty progressive, so they were tackling some, some pretty progressive plays. Yeah, and we oh. did Shakespeare. <laughs> hey, Jasper just went running by. <laughs> Very so cool. It was, it was small, but intense, which I think, I don't know, did you have a theater kind of experience at all? We, the, the high school that I went to, I, was, I went to a small high school too in New Jersey, and we had about 158 kids in my graduating class. But we had an amazing um, music department and an amazing theater department. And they had an incredible, um, like this beautiful auditorium with a stage with this huge, you know, uh, gallery and like they would have scrims and all kinds of things. Like it was, it was legit. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was not involved in any of that. Um, I <laughs> was, was it too intimidating? Or no, it just wasn't on my. It, it wasn't on my radar at all. I mean, Got I was it. I was in bands and um and I, and I was in bands and I was playing baseball and. Like my after school activities, that's what they were. And then I ended up taking a class my, I think it was either my senior year or my, or my junior year. I think it was my senior year where it was a, it was a theater class. I had to take something like that and I decided to take that and I loved it, but I, I never thought in a million years that this would be something that I would even entertain doing. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I thought it was really hard. It was fun, but it was, I thought it was really, really hard. And everybody else that was in that class with me were so much better mm. and had done, you know, like, like theater and community stuff ever since, uh, you know, they were little kids. So they were all like, you know, these little theater kids. And yeah. I, I just was like this weird rock and roller who kind of with long, with a, with a mullet in, you know, in this. Oh no. Class. Hey Jasper, how are you, man? Good to see you. It's been a while. He, uh -huh. Jasper's acting. Is he? Good for him, man. Yeah, he's a natural. Right so on. Go back to your, your mullet days. Oh, well, my God. So, wait, wait. Question. This is... All right. Go ahead. Let me ask you a quick question. Since we're on the topic, because yes. it's really interesting to me, what makes a person become an actor? Like, here you are. You're this m musician, mm. and it seems like you're doing great. Yeah. Why would anyone give up anything that they're good at or even bad at to be a, an actor. It seems improbable and a bad decision on the well, face of it to me. It was, it was kind of a weird, th I kind of fell into it backwards. Cause when I got to college, I went, when I went to high point university in North Carolina and when I got there, um, you know, I, I was going to do, uh, I was going to study music engineering. And when I got there, that department was dropped. And I had no direction. I had nowhere to go. And um, and I was on like kind of like a probation, you know, with the school because my grades were so incredibly bad. They took me on as a charity case and basically said to me, if you can get over a 2.0 in your first semester, you can stay. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. That's a low bar. I know. <laughs> so... Um, uh, and I, I had a meeting with, I, I guess, you know, kind of like a, like, you know, when you're, when you're a freshman, I guess they give you like a, like an advisor or like a counselor. Or something. Yeah. Right. Like a, yeah. And sure. I remember going into his office and, and he says to me, he's like, well, I see that you've, you know, signed up for this class and this class and this class. He's like, how come you're not taking any of my classes? I said, well, I don't know what classes you teach. And he's like, well, I'm, I, I teach theater, uh, 
I'm, I'm the head of the theater department. And I was like, oh. He's like, well, I'm, I'm not an actor. I don't know why I, I would want to do that. And he says, well, it says on your transcript that you're a theater arts major. What? And I was like, what? Really? I was like, that's strange. He's like, well, why don't you take, you know, why don't you come down and take a class and maybe you can, you know, help us out with, uh, cause you're good at sound. Maybe you can help us out like running audio and stuff. So I ended up running audio for the play bus stop. And I remember being blown away by how amazing all the actors were. And I, that's and, a great, and you know, I, I saw where, Oh, these are kind of where like the, the, uh, these are where the cool girls are too. Yeah. And, uh, and I was after that. I had started, you know, taking acting classes, and I and then I auditioned and started booking the the plays. Um, and that's kind of how I got into it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the next four years was all about just me and theater, um, which which was not part of the plan at all. And John, that was in college or high school? That was college. College. So high Where school. Was that? that was High Point, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. And, is that, uh, a, is that a, um, a, a liberal arts school? Yeah, it's, it's a liberal arts school. Um, is it kind of famous for uh, its program? Well, it's gotten kind of more famous. But when I was there, um, the guy who was running it, Ron Law, was this amazing um, – he was an amazing teacher. He kind of had a method background. His heroes were Harold Clerman and guys like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, he is, was an amazing theater, uh, director and an amazing acting coach and very charismatic and, and taught me a lot and, you know, really instilled an amazing, you know, a really hardcore work ethic with me, um, which I kind of had from being in bands. Cause I, I, I had to deal with, you know, playing gigs when I was 16 years old and getting ripped off by promoters and stuff. So I, I, you know, but he instilled more of a, you know, kind of a disciplined work ethic as opposed to the rock and roll kind of like show up to a gig and then blow all the money at the bar afterwards kind of thing. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so um, that's kind of how I got into it. But where did you end up going after high school? What, what happened then? So I went to LSU, just a big state school. Yeah. Um, they have a football program, right? <laughs> <laughs> and LSU, to me, at the time, living in New Orleans, it's like 90 miles away. I just thought I was, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to the north. It felt like I was making a big move. Wow. Just going 90 miles northwest. And um, it's a, it, I was a journalism major okay. for a year. What did you want to do? Did you want, what kind of writing did you want to do? I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I was kind of good at writing, so I thought, well, I'll be a journalism major. And I was in the middle of the class, and I realized, oh, my God, you know, this is the umpteenth class that I have not said a word about current issues where these really heated debates. And because I realized I did not read the newspaper. I was like, it's taken me a year to realize I have no business being here. <laughs> But being a theater major seemed like so stupid. But I thought, ah, I got yeah. I mean, let's talk about that for a second. So I, I mean, did it. So I did that, and and it was a it was such a huge relief for me once but, I decided to major in theater. right. But 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 the idea of being a theater major, um, like when I said when I told my parents that, they were like, what? <laughs> 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 they could. I mean, they were super supportive. Um. But they were like, oh, okay, uh, what was the reaction on your end? My mom, who's a bookkeeper and okay. is very practical, yeah. did not get it at all. And um, she, I mean, she knew I liked acting. Yeah. But she also knew how impractical it was. But my dad, who was an architect and always kind of supported, you know, the arts and stuff, he thought yeah. it was a great idea. So I got lucky. So they supported, they were supportive of it. Yeah. I mean, they came to the plays and they were right. excited. This, that, you know, it's hard to deny when your kid is up there doing it. Yeah. You know, it's hard to say it, it's still impractical, but it's hard to not be at least, at least a little charmed and excited by it. What was the program like at LSU? I would imagine they probably had a pretty kick-ass program. <clears throat> well, like you, we had this guru. His name is John Dennis. Mm. He was at the Mark Taper Forum out, out here in L.A. for a while. Mm. And he was um, he was super charming and 
rigorous and I don't know, inspiring. He was, he inspired a lot of students. And I think almost everybody that was in his first graduate school class is still acting today and, and doing well. So that's nice. So they all kind of went off and had nice little careers. Yeah. They're that's all working great. right now, you know? Yeah. Amazing. Right. So, so he, I could, it's hard to say what it was he did that inspired everybody. What kind of, what kind of acting, um, was it method based? No, <clears throat> excuse me. No, not at all. No. Uh, um, he, he seemed to be improv based. Oh, that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he insisted, you know, this thing where you're supposed to act, um, with actions, you know, um, he would give us this list of verbs, mm. you know, it was like every verb in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't playing something active, he would have this cowbell that he would hit <laughs> with a stick. And if you, because he insisted that you were active. Right. You, so if you were to, it was almost the opposite of, of any kind of wallowing in your emotion. Right. And, and any kind of, <laughs> it was almost anti method in a way. Okay. And that's, if you, uh, yeah. That's cool. That's really interesting because, you know, there isn't any one real way to do anything. You know, I think you got to, I think most good actors realize that, that if it works, you got to use it. And, for sure. You I know, mean, it's, 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 you gotta get do rid it. of, get rid of the crap that doesn't work. And, and it's like the Bruce Lee kind of mentality with fighting. He's like, you know, take everything in and just get rid of the things that don't work. Yeah. Um, I think just whatever you can, whatever gets you, I, there's so many different ways to act. And it would be really, it would be really boring if not only if just you allowed one way, Yeah. but if, even if you're as a person, as an actor, if you try just one way, that, you know, it's, you got to try everything and every role calls for something, a different approach. There's yeah. some roaches, roles you've got to go approach it internally and you have to use some of the methods of the method. Sure. There's no way out of it. And there are other ones where you, it's best to just start outward and see where it start physically and then go in. Yeah. No, good point. I mean, you know, that's, I think it holds a lot of actors back sticking to one thing. Yeah, and, and look, those those are false delineations anyway. Yeah. Everyone is both at the same time. Yeah. Jasper, will you turn my phone off? Thanks. Sorry. No, that's all good. Uh, I can edit that out. Um, so after, so okay, so you're at LSU. Were you getting lead roles right away? Uh, in the production? No. no. What was happening there? I, I never got, I never got lead roles in high school. I didn't get lead roles until the very end of college. Okay. And then when I moved to Chicago after college to be a stage actor, because mm -hmm. I heard that's where you go. What, ha what happened was yeah. yeah I, I was thinking one day I would go to New York. Mm -hmm. But I started in, in Chicago because <clears throat> A buddy of mine got us an audition at um, Actors Theater of Louisville, okay. which is really far from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And we decided, we, he's like, I, I know somebody. We're getting an audition at the Actors Theater of Louisville. I think I was 19 or something. And we drove in one shot, and the next morning, exhausted, I did this monologue that I pieced together from Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Uh -huh. You know, the... the Levine, yeah. the machine, like the oldest character yeah. in the play, who's the whole point was that he's this washed up has been. And I'm doing this monologue and I I had no business. It was like I might have been wearing a, like a fake beard and put gray in my hair. And the lady just was the casting director was dumbfounded. And she said, you know, after I was done, she's like, You you really need some experience. Why don't you go to Chicago? There's a lot of theater there. So I took her at her word and I went. And then I immediately started getting leads, which I hadn't gotten. Amazing. Before. So let's let's talk about that. So when you went out to Chicago, did you have any connections out there? 
<clears throat> sorry. It's okay. I had a friend who lived in Chicago, and um, she, her boyfriend was was unfortunately hit by a train in France. Jesus. And I decided to go visit her and see how she was doing. And um, she lived outside of Chicago, and she took me into the city on July 4th in the middle of their uh, Taste of Chicago celebration. Wow. And it was summer, and it was beautiful. And I thought, oh, my God, this city is magical. And then in January, I, I saved up money painting houses, and I flew there in January, and it was dark, and it looked like, like the set from Batman, you know? Yeah. Just and I thought, what the hell? Did, I was really m mistaken when I decided yeah. to move here. Yeah. But it was too late, and um, Chicago theater was a, turned out to be a great experience. So, how did you get involved? Were you did you enroll in classes, or did you were you just like just auditioning for for whatever plays were being cast? How how how, how did that go down? Yeah, I um I felt immediately lost until I found a class with other actors. Mm -hmm. And then I just listened to them and took their advice and found out how to audition. And, you know, I was pretty rigorous. Like, I, I'm not kidding, John. I was, I would wake up every day and I had about a book that I kept of monologues. Mm -hmm. I had about 20 monologues. And every day by myself, I would wake up and I would, rehearse these monologues and give them and just till I knew them backwards and forwards like I would read Shakespeare plays and right. and 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 learn these monologues just because I knew I had to act every day yeah so I would do it in this complete vacuum and I'm not sure it was helpful yeah because getting in class was really what helped but, no, but, it, but it was a way for me to to remind myself that I I was an actor Right. And, and, you know, you're sharpening your tool. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> um, over and over. Over and over. <laughs> so uh, what were you doing for work, though? Like, what was your, what was your, uh, what was your side hustle gig? How are you making money? I was a bus boy. In fact, uh -huh. I was so bad at that, I couldn't even be a waiter. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So that was a busboy. Right on. And then were you, so you were developing your skills with these, you know, and being around other Chicago actors, you were getting guidance from them and you were auditioning. And when did, when did the work start to roll in? So it was about a year later, I was auditioning for this play for, do you know Paul Sills is? Mm, no. He started Second City. Okay. He, he was uh, Mike Nichols' first, you know, teacher. Okay. His mom is Viola Spolin, and she invented theater games, the old concept of theater games. And okay. She passed it on to him, and he started um, Second City in in uh, the University of Chicago, I think. Mm -hmm. And he was directing a play about this guy, a Chicago icon named Studs Terkel. Oh, I know who Studs Terkel is. Oh, okay. So they needed a young actor to play him from age seven to age 60 mm -hmm. and so it was quite a kind of a range and and i went to the audition and i was doing okay and i was doing paul sills at like i'm doing studs turkle at like 13 right and paul Sills said um i want you to do this again but tell me you're show me that you're 13 or rather, he said, be 13 without being outwardly 13. Were you really young looking? Yeah, I, well, okay. I, I was. Yeah, I was okay. young looking. And I was young. And I was like... So what were you? How old were you? Like around 21? Yeah, 22. Uh, yeah, but you still looked like you could... I you still had been. a young look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I was like, wait, you want me to act like I'm 13? but not show that I'm 13. It was almost like a riddle. Mm. But he said it in a way, because he's kind of a guru himself. Mm. And I was like, I think I know what he means. I think I can do this. And I kind of like, for the first time ever, 
kind of like took this chance in the moment and uh it 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 worked and he hired me on the spot and it was this great learning experience because i had these long monologues where i had to speak directly to the audience and <clears throat> i'd never done that that frightened me that yeah. i had to break the third wall and, yeah. and he taught me how to do that he just taught me so much so i got i looked out and by the end of the show he said look M mike nichols and i and george morrison are starting this school in new york and i want you to come and be a student there for free on uh, and we'll we'd love for you to you know we'll host you amazing and Did i you said, end up going i said no what an asshole <laughs> i know <laughs> i said i just got out of school i can't go back to school oh and i was God. such an idiot i could have gone to new york city <sighs> i could have met mike nichols i it, I was so stupid and so arrogant in my, you know, in that innocent way. That right, right. Off. Oh, my God. Wow. That's my life, John. My life is just full of th those kind of arrogant things. Yeah, but, you know, you seem to have navigated your way through most of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so while you were in Chicago, were you studying improv? No, I no. never studied improv. No, neither and did I. I. Always wish I had. So do I. I, you know, and I always like my wife. You know, Claire always is haranguing me about it, and uh, yeah, that's not the word I should use. She's always suggesting that I should <laughs> <laughs> that I should do improv. Um, but I, I'm going to be honest what with you. What kept you from doing it? I don't like theater games. I don't like that <laughs> shit. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't say it's shit because it's valuable to I guess to some people who 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 use it but i've always wanted to just dive into the scene mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know um you know warming up and all that stuff is fine I, I like doing all that and i like doing stretching exercises and breathing exercises because i think all that stuff is super like breathing is really important mm -hmm. especially when you're doing theater you have to know how to breathe when you're on stage mm -hmm. um like when you're doing something with massive amounts of dialogue, like a mammoth play or, or Shakespeare or something like that, you have to be able to control your breathing. But breathing improv, helped me, John. Did it? Just in, I, I want you to finish that thought. This is just well, anyway, I, basically what I was just going to say was that, um, like, I didn't like theater games. I didn't, it felt childish to me. And I wanted to do, because I, I would sit and I'd look at them and I go, I don't think Robert De Niro and Al Pacino were doing that kind of thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I had I guess I had some <clears throat> some ego about it too, and um, and I feel like that's something that I definitely could work on uh, one of these days. Yeah. Know. Well, look, the, the, just Robert De Niro and, and Al Pacino, who were my heroes too, they were doing stuff that came out of the theater out in the '30s, right? The yeah. group theater kind that's of. That's what I was doing. Stuff. Yeah. Well, the 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 theater games came out actually around the same time. Mm. They just went into a, they just branched out into a, almost like an evolutionary path, right? Yeah. They went into Second City and sure. and comedy. Yeah. And maybe that was the thing. I don't think I felt like I was ever a comedic actor. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm really not. I don't ever get to do that kind of work. Although I like doing it on the occasion when I do get it, but um. But yeah, I, I think I always. Uh, but think paired... about how f funny Robert De Niro. Oh yeah, can be, and yeah, Al Pacino totally. too. Just yeah, think totally. of the humor that's sort of mixed in with their yeah, their drama. I mean, Robert De Niro particularly is is both menacing and funny at the exact same time. Oh yeah, he's a total character. Um, yeah, yeah he, he's so much fun to watch. Um, but okay. I helped. I, I found that breathing. Yeah, Th that breathing that you're talking about, how important it is in theater. Yeah, when I started doing camera stuff, I found that it helped me there too. How not so? so much, not so much with projection, but with um, relaxation. Yeah, because I'm such I'm a very anxious performer, but I found that the same breathing techniques that I learned for the stage, mm -hmm. I would just use to calm me down in front of the camera. Can you can you give us an example of like or kind of talk talk us through how what you would do? 
<laughs> Do you want to give away your secrets? No, no, come on. Okay. Well, like in theater, I, you know, there's this exercise, and, and it, I think it comes from uh, Stanislavski. I'm not sure. But where you stand on stage by yourself, and you breathe deliberately, and you just are. You try yeah. not to be anything. And you occlude everything around you. You just make it all disappear. And you see yourself in a sort of a spotlight, right? A literal spotlight if you're in a theater. Mm-hmm. And everything around you is, you're safe mm-hmm. in that place because you're just, you're okay to be who you are. And it's okay to be flawed and everyone around you, it's okay for, and then you slowly, you start to include the audience in your mind mm. and you're still safe and you can just be. Well, that's how I was with the camera. Mm. Like when I thought of that camera, when I first started and I thought, oh, fuck, I got to do a movie. Mm-hmm. How, how am I going to relax with that camera four feet away from me? Yeah. And I thought of that same exercise. So I would just breathe. I would look in the camera. I would take in the cameraman and the crew, mm-hmm. the DP and mm-hmm. the cinematographer. And and I would kind of talk to them and let them in on my little circle. And then I felt like, oh, they're just an audience that's a little bit smaller. You know how you have to project in big theaters and make things smaller in little theaters. Well, this is just a very small space. And those guys are my pals, my yeah. intimates. Yeah. I mean, they want you to win. So yeah, uh, it, it's funny because, you know, I, I think at first when I, when I first started out doing films and stuff, I was so intimidated by the camera and so intimidated by all the crew guys and, and, and what I failed to realize at the time was they're all rooting for you to, to do to, to do a great job and get the job done so that yeah. they can go home and you know get on with yeah. it. Um, uh, but yeah, and they takes... also know what they also know what is working, what isn't, because they're right. they're yeah. they're. I mean, such an intimate thing. They're looking right at you. Yeah, yeah, it they're is. So... And yet, have you? I don't know if you found this, John, but like, if you've ever deferred to a guy behind the camera and asked him what he thought. Oh yeah. They're always honest. Yeah. They're always supportive. They're always so cool yeah. and helpful. Well, I think it's valuable to, you know, make that connection with, especially with the camera operator um, or whoever, or the DP um, to, to, you know, kind of develop a nice, you know, kind of relationship and like, how can I make your job easier? Like what's, what works best for you? And, and without stepping on the director's toes, you know, just kind of keep, do you do that when you're on set? Yeah. And, and I go even further. I, yeah. I like, I, I can't, I can't perform without making friends almost with right. The, right. Know, right. And then it's like, it's group effort at that point because everyone, you know, is, and but all my bad habits, you know, mm-hmm. they they forgive. Like, yeah. I, I will look right at the camera. I will miss my mark half the time. Yeah, you'll miss. I you will find your light. You will. <laughs> I will fuck up my line, and make their job harder. Right. Because, like you said, they they want you to do well. Yeah. And they are they're pretty forgiving people. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's nice when, when, I mean, I've been in situations where that isn't the case too, though. Um, But uh, for the most part, my experience has always been that, you know, they're all in it together and they want you to win. Um, But let's go back a little bit. Um, I want to go touch a little bit more on Chicago. So were you, when you, were, were they, were they casting films and things in Chicago? Were you going out for any of those at all? Yeah, I did. I did um, a few little TV shows okay. when I was there. Right. But um, unlike you, I kind of I went to because there were there was such a lag time between shows because mm-hmm. I was an equity actor, mm-hmm. and it it was hard to to get enough work. Like mm-hmm. I probably did a show every one a year, which wasn't yeah. much. No. So, but the but... rest of the year, I was, I needed to do something. So I did it the reverse of you. 
I started writing songs and being a musician just to have something creative to do. So that started in Chicago, you you playing guitar and 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 yeah, getting, wasn't, getting in front of people and playing at live. Yeah, I wasn't 20, I was 26 when I started and you you were, So you you, you had never 13? picked up a guitar uh how old was i i was yeah i think i was 13 when i started playing bass um with the neighborhood kids and yeah but but uh, so you weren't i was playing 26 when i picked up a guitar wow really yeah amazing and it, it wasn't even mine it belonged to an ex-girlfriend who had no use for it and i was like so you just said give it to me <laughs> yeah i was like can i have that <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow As, so who so yeah. Was that, yeah. were you using that as, so you were using that to fill the void? When Just you to fill the void. And, and at the same time you were doing theater too? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then, and then I got this kind of, um, this commercial, because I was also doing a lot of commercials. Mm -hmm. to, uh, and I got this commercial for Bud Light. And um, it was kind of, um, it was one of the first characters, you know, do you, do you remember the Yes I Am campaign? Yes. That was me. And it was like one of the first kind of catchphrase campaign things. And those guys were really generous with me. And they wanted me to do more and mm -hmm. to do a, a larger campaign because it, it was, I guess it was working. Yeah. And once again, my arrogance was like, no way, <laughs> not going to be. I'm not gonna be the beer guy, right? But that money, actor. that and money like they, back then was the I, bomb. I, I needed money so bad, yeah. And they offered me so much money, and I just said no. I oh my god! No. I said no and no and no again. And then Barbara Streisand's manager in LA, because he wanted to meet me, so I flew out to LA, and he's like, "Yeah, I would love to manage you." I, I'm a fan of these commercials and I think you, we could maybe get you a show and TriStar offered me a development deal. And I was like, no, I was so used to saying no. I was like, no, I will not play the Bud Light guy. Oh my God. And, um, so I went to but a little is, bit of a spiral let, let, for like hold five on, years. Hold on a minute. I, I want to stick with this. So, you were really sticking to your guns. You were not, you did not want to sell out. Is that exactly? Is that... I had this notion that that was selling out because they because they were offering me a TV show or a development deal that right. a possible TV show that right. would be based on this character in this commercial. Right. And I said to myself, I'm an actor. This isn't acting. This is going to, kill me right because you you were and, afraid um, that it was going to ruin what you wanted to do which was i wanted to be dustin hoffman uh yeah i didn't want to be the bud light guy i didn't right. to me it felt like a joke yeah even though i needed the money yeah john i i was young and idealistic and stupid i was too man and you know when i i remember i I couldn't get an agent in New York. Um, I ended up getting a manager who, a commercial, uh, like a manager that sent me out on commercials. And I thought the way I looked at it, well, I felt the same exact way. I thought I'm a, you know, first of all, you know, I, I was in, I was still kind of, I had a rock and roll kind of attitude about things. Like I was heavy into like Neil Young and the whole, like don't sell out kind of mentality. Yeah. And, but my manager said to me, she said, look, you've never worked on a film set and working on a commercial set is good training. So you should, you should at least try. Yeah. And, I thought, and all the other actors around me in New York were doing commercials because at the time there weren't, there wasn't that much work. Um, there were some indie films and, and like, you know, you had law and order and maybe the Cosby show that was shooting in Queens. And, oh, is that right? I mean, yeah. Well, what, I think the later, the later Cosby Show, uh, whatever like incarnation of it was. So New York was mostly theater at the time. It was mostly theater and and, and like you know a couple of episodic you know things like like Law and Order and or procedurals or whatever they're called um, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and I think I'm the only actor in New York that never did Law and Order when I was there. Yeah. Um, so. 
I was like, fuck it. I guess I'll try it. I guess I'll try to do commercials. And so I auditioned for a couple and I booked some and, and, and I ended up kind of getting out of the hole financially a little bit, you know, it kind yeah. of floated me for a while and then it gave me kind of experience and it kind of, you know, snowballed a little bit after that. Um, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that mindset but you got to be a certain type of person too that 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 can do commercials i think you know um uh you know you, you got to be you know you got to be one of those people that you know appeals to a lot of people yeah um, yeah yeah and yeah. i i never felt like i was like that that guy i was never the the life of the party guy i was never um i was never that guy um even though i, I know did, exactly i know exactly what you mean you know, I felt like I you had, exactly I felt like you had to be like the class clown kind of guy to be, to do commercials. Well, in Chicago, when you audition for a commercial, those rooms, those waiting rooms, yeah, they were full of Second City people. Oh yeah. Or, you know, or uh, there were various comedy improv groups, you know. Yeah. And those rooms were much like, just like you said, it was a bunch of, um, not in a bad way, class clowns. Right. Who who just sort of dominated the room and it made, it would have made you feel. You know, I, I hate, I hated being in those no, waiting no, rooms. You didn't belong there. I hated being in those waiting rooms in New York. It was a drag. I mean, it was, it was always, um, it was such a, I, I always felt like it was a really toxic environment because of like the, the constant like jockeying for position and alpha mailing and all that shit going on. It drove, it, I didn't like it at all. Um, yeah, any but, you waiting know, room is horrible though I know it sucks it's the worst part of it <laughs> <It's the worst. laughs> it really is and unfortunately it is the um, not only is it the worst part but is the, the, the biggest part yeah. of, of what we do yeah waiting yeah, and waiting rooms yep yep and uh, I had no idea it would be this weird yeah to be an actor. and now you know with the way things are going today it's even weirder because <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if there's going to yeah. be waiting rooms anymore. Yeah, yeah, like I would kill to be in a waiting room. Right <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh man. So, um, so, I, so I did. So I went. So I said no. And yeah. um, oh, that's unbelievable. Uh, Barbara Streisand's manager, who was a lovely guy, basically dropped me <sighs> because I said no every time he talked uh -huh. to me. And so I went through this sort of almost like spiral for a few years where I just played music. Not that it was bad. I loved playing music. Yeah. But what I, kind of what kind of music were I you? I wasn't doing? that good. No, but what punk were you pop. Punk pop, yeah. Yeah. And um I loved the band. I loved loved being in a band. Yeah. I loved the band members. I loved traveling. I loved we did tours and it's, blah blah blah. It's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. It was so much fun. Yeah. But it was also, it, I, when the band broke up, I was like, I, have, I don't know where I am. I'm way too old to start anything new. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought I'd go back to acting. And I did this Shakespeare play, and I met Laura. Mm -hmm. And she's Laura, sort of, your, your lovely wife who I yeah, love. Yeah, who has basically saved me. Yes. And she said, let's move to, she said, I'm moving to L.A. And I, she, she didn't even like me yet. And I was like, I'm moving with you. <laughs> and she's like, okay. And then um, I got, the, I was auditioning for a, a movie that was coming into town. And um, it was a Coen Brothers film for a mm -hmm. small part. And the casting director said, wait, you're, you, you're Eddie Jemison. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, I've been looking for you. Steven Soderbergh has a film he wants you to be in. And I had the script in my car, and I was like, well, I have to audition for that, too? She goes, no, 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 you, you got the part. Holy shit. Really? You, that that just, happened? Yeah. And I said, what is this? <laughs> she said, I'll give you the script, and, and you need to learn your, your part, because you're, uh -huh. you're in the film. And, and before I knew it, I was thrown into this old, whole other world, and my life went from this kind of like a guy living in his studio apartment, smoking cigarettes and being depressed. Yeah. To having to make a life in in L.A. What was the Soderbergh film? Ocean's Eleven. Holy shit! That's not. That's unbelievable. 
to, to that was that was your first gig your first film gig well i had done a film with soderbergh i had met him at lsu uh-huh he was oh, from that okay okay like he was he was filming things and he would come to see the plays we did mm-hmm. and we had mutual friends mm-hmm. and he did um a few little projects that you know i, I did with him right me and all the other guys you right. know Right. And then he made this film called Schizopolis. Oh yeah. While I was in Chicago mm-hmm. with the same group of guys. Yeah. And um, so I had done that film. Oh okay, all right. So you'd worked with them before. Yeah, like okay. but I hadn't talked. But to not them. on not on the scale of like something like Ocean. Oh, Schizopolis! It's like a this sort of cultish indie mm-hmm. film. It's brilliant, yeah. but it's yeah, I remember it. He, I think the crew was maybe four people. Yeah. yeah. And he was one of them. And um, so I hadn't talked to him in, I don't know, it was like six years? Wow. Maybe longer. Mm -hmm. So it was still out of the blue. Mm. But that's amazing, like, serendipity that you show up at that casting office. And, God, that's amazing. So, So then that must have really kicked things off for you. I immediately moved to LA and um, Laura came with me and started acting in in LA. Now, did you find it? And I was already old, you know, I was already 37, 36. Wow. Yeah. Because I moved out here when I was 30. Yeah. Did you feel like that was too, too late? Well, you know, I felt like I spent way too much time in New York. Um, and then, like, my last couple of years in New York, I, I booked some pretty big things that, you know, well, I, at least what I thought was pretty big at the time. I did a film with Maureen Stapleton. Oh, yeah? How and was that? It was a trip. It was my first feature. Uh, it, was called, it was called Living and Dining. She's was, a group theater person, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, it was her last film, the last thing she ever did. And unfortunately, it never got released. Um, it just got shelved. Um and then I did another film called The Ticking Man, which is uh, kind of like a, like a thriller. And you can find it if you look hard for it, but uh, <laughs> don't. Just, just do yourself a favor and, and don't do it. Uh, <clears throat> but we, I thought that, you know, I was like, cool, I think I'm ready to move out, move out to L.A. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, and I dragged Claire out with me. But when I got out here, it was a rude awakening. Because, <clears throat> sorry. Take your rude, time. No, um, man, this I is like interesting. A, I got like a frog in my throat. It was a rude awakening because at the time when I moved out here, I was too old to play certain roles and too young to play certain roles. I was in that awful, like, gray area. Mm-hmm. And I had always been, like, the leading man, ingenue type of thing. But now yeah. it, it just wasn't, it wasn't working for me out here. Yeah. And I decided... I did one or two things. I, I think I did uh, an episode of 24 and an episode of Crossing Jordan. I might have shot a commercial, and then that was it. But that's and, not so bad. Yeah, it was, I, you know, at the time I thought it was pretty cool. And then there was that strike that happened, and there was no work. And right. And I was like, what am I going to do? Uh, so I thought, well, I'll get married and start a band. <laughs> so that's that's what happened. You know, I ended up starting another band, and I took time off from acting and, until I felt like I had a little more years behind me and was able to kind of play roles that were a little bit more, you know, kind of up my alley. What kind of band was it? Uh, the first band was kind of like a rock and roll, like a psychedelic rock and roll band called Droves, and we were kind of inspired by bands like oasis and black rebel Mo- motorcycle club like that kind of vibe yeah i love both those, I so, love like, both those bands. so very heavy uh but with groove and then but, that band but, that band broke up and, and also I, very melodic yeah exactly yeah and th- that band broke up and then i formed another band with the uh, the guitar player of that band and uh an old band mate of mine from high school uh called narco tourist and that was kind of an electronica um heavy rock and roll dance band we spent two years recording mm-hmm. an album playing gigs and then that f- completely fell apart um which is a shame and then after that i w- didn't know what to do with myself so i went back into acting i had had a daughter mm-hmm. and uh 
you know, um, I was losing my mind and I couldn't understand why. And it was because I wasn't, I wasn't doing the thing I wanted to do. Oh. Um, but then it was, it was, it was a, eating away at you that you weren't acting. Oh my God. I, my health was terrible. I was, um, uh, I was in bad shape, like very, very bad shape health wise. Uh, I was just wasn't, I wasn't happy. I was depressed. I was, I wasn't happy at all until I started acting again. And it was a hard slog back because, you know, and you, I mean, maybe you know this, but um, as far as like, you know, when you're, when you're trying to get work and you've been out of work for a while, you're, the demo reel is so important. And the footage that I had for my demo reel was still on like VHS tapes. So it looked like shit and it was super dated. So I ended up, uh, you know, I, I, I ended up creating my own content. I created a web series uh, called The Rolling Soldier, which ended up kind of re kickstarting my career. And then that's like led to many, many things. And uh, that's great. That's, that's, I how I, that. that's how I did it. But I'm still, it's still a super uphill battle for me. Um, mm. I'm still I'm battling and I'm like, I'm fighting over like, co-star roles and guest star roles and and Mm -hmm. like i'm trying to move my way past that because i know that's not really you know why i'm doing this and 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 what Mm -hmm. i'm capable of but um but yeah you know i i when i when i came out to la i came out in 2000 and it it was just i spent too long in new york i should have moved out here when i was in i should have gotten out here by the time i was 26 um, I came out in 2001, so yeah. one year later. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, roughly around the same time. So then after... Oh, no, so... no, like, but hang on, though, really quickly. Yeah. Just to challenge you for a second. Sure. You said you spent too much time in New York. Hmm. Because you felt like you, you should have been younger when you were here? The opportunities would have been I feel better? Like, I feel like I would have had more opportunity as a younger actor... And I would have gotten more experience under my belt in film uh, if I had moved out to film and television, if I had moved out to L.A. earlier, um, because there just wasn't that much going on in New York. Things started to happen like right around the time I started, to, right around the time I'd left. Things were mm. picking up there. Um, I, I wasn't completely aware of it, but um, but they were starting to bring more production into New York and, and started to shoot more stuff. Um, and I just was but I like... Feel like- I feel like my theater experience was every bit as as cool as as being in LA. No, I I, I get that, um, and I felt like my my experience every bit theater, is rewarding. If yeah, my theater experience in New York was good too, but I, I wasn't I wasn't in I, I did a, the occasional play, but I was most of my time was in the classroom. Mm. Like, you know, just doing scene study with, I studied with Terry Schreiber. I was there for like almost 10 years, mm. you know, just like sharpening my, my skills as the best I could. Um, I just feel like I, I was just, I just was in the oven a little too long there. <laughs> you know? sure. Okay. I get that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's, it's the way it goes. And, um, and I was stoked that I was able to do a film with Maureen Stapleton. That was really cool. That is uh, great. Yeah. So, uh, so, okay. So then you do, so let's talk. I, I want to know what the experience was like for you when you get on a set like Ocean's Eleven and you've got, can, I you, was... hear, my, can you hear my dogs? Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I don't care. The, anytime any, somebody comes to the door, it's like the whole world's ending. <laughs> um, so I, let's kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, I was scared out of my mind. You mostly. must have been. I mean, th- I, I was mostly mostly living in fear for all those months on set. How know? many months were you on set? I don't know, like three. Was it all in Las Vegas or was it in L.A. too? The first movie was mostly in Las Vegas. Okay. A little bit a little bit in L.A. Right, right. Um, and when I wasn't on set, I was living in a motel, a hotel in the Bellagio. Mm-hmm. And just like I didn't know what to do. Yeah, I, was like, I didn't have a car. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, where would I go anyway? And, yeah. and I, I was I was so used to walking from living in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I would just walk up and down the strip and run my lines in my head. Wow. And then go to my hotel room and write songs. Yeah. So 
And when then I would be on set, and I would just be scared out of my mind. How would you get over the fear? Like when you're walking on set and there's like George Clooney and Brad Pitt and guys like that, like what were you doing to kind of like, how, how, how did you manage that? <laughs> like what, I, would you, what did you do? Did you just walk on and just go, fuck it, I just got to do it? Yeah, that's when I started using those breathing exercises yeah, I was telling I you bet. about. I would breathe and breathe and... Look, I you know, <clears throat> I tried to fit in. Mm. Those guys were very generous to me. That's great. And very entertaining and very cool. So I mostly I would just listen. And they were very entertaining. So yeah. I mostly just kind of listened and laughed. And I would maybe once in a while crack a joke. And, you know, mm. Bernie Mac would say, Casey, say that again. Can't say that again. Mm -hmm. I would say I'm I'm Eddie. I'm not Casey. And he's like, I don't know you, Eddie. <laughs> Tell him that joke. And so he he and and Matt would like sort of they were very kind. And whatever little joke I would say under my breath because I was so scared to say it to the crowd, they would kind of push me forward and make me include they, me. They included you. They brought you into the fold. That's so great. Yeah, and I mean, golly, you know, look, it, it was not hard. There's something about George Clooney who, that guy, he he wants everyone in the fold. Yeah. That's his, that was his, that, it seemed like from day one that was his main objective on the set was to include everybody in the game. That's such a generous thing to do. And it just puts everybody at ease too. Yes. You know. He, he's, he's. That makes me. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that, to hear that. John, yeah. He's a genius at that. Yeah, amazing. Wow, man. So then, and you know, and and Brad Pitt, he was a genius the, the other way. He would be so quietly, mm. um, supportive and sweet to me. And mm. you know, I I was making a record at the time, um, kind of semi solo record. Mm. And I, I, I gave it to him. I said, do you want to listen to the CD? I'm giving you my CD. Here it is. And he's like, well, let's go listen to it then. <laughs> and I was great. like, well, when? He goes, right now. And it would take me in his his dressing room, I mean, in his trailer, uh -huh. smoke cigarettes and listen to the entire album oh, from start amazing. to finish with him just kind of grooving, making little comments. So they couldn't have been more cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Did you notice when you were working with those guys, did you notice, I mean, you, you brought up that Brad Pitt was a little bit more kind of laid back and kind of, you know, not as outgoing as maybe Clooney was, but did you notice a difference in their, in, in their like tech, not, I don't want to say technique, but in the way that they kind of approach things? I was kind of amazed by the way they would, um, Sometimes uh, Soderbergh would have to say action, or not Soderbergh, whoever said action, mm. uh, Greg. Greg would say action several times because they weren't listening. They were cutting <laughs> up so much. Yeah. And then, but when they would kick in, they were like, they it, was it was locked in. And that I saw both of those guys do. Yeah. And... I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it at first. Mm. I felt like it wasn't fair. Mm. And I felt like it was a kind of witchcraft, kind of sorcery yeah. trick thing they were doing. Yeah. And I still don't know how they did it, but they both had that in common. That's super cool. And I will say about Matt Damon was, I've never seen anybody enjoy acting as much as he did. Oh, that's the it, best to hear he, that. It was like, he was like a dog, you know, that likes to play. He really enjoyed it in the corniest way. He just loved it. He saw it from, from my point of view, look, I don't know anything about these guys. Mm -hmm. They, I was just happened to be on set with them. Yeah. And this is what I, my brain was telling me. Yeah. He seemed to really enjoy it. Well, they must've liked you because they brought you back for the, for the sequels. <laughs> you must've done something, kind of right? <laughs> I mean, Jesus. It could I have been like, maybe... oh, we got this guy again? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> With the records? He's going to push a record on me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Oh, man. So 
that must have been an incredible experience. And Don Cheadle, also wickedly, oh, yeah. wickedly funny. Maybe the funniest of them all. Really? Really well, he's, fighting, he, wicked sense of humor. He does really well with comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he, I've always enjoyed him in comedies. Um, what's that show he's on now that was that's, that's a comedy? I can't remember what the hell it's called, but it's pretty good. Nah, it'll come to me later. Yeah, I'm but, sorry. I don't, yeah, I don't no, it's, TV. It, I know, right? Um, so after all the ocean success and all that, what kind of did that open up a bunch of doors for you, or were you back in the mix, like you know, slugging it out with everybody else? How did that? What was going on after that? Well, like I did, a, I did the first pilot I auditioned for. I got. And... What was that? Hung? No, no, that was a little later. Oh, okay. It it never did air. Oh, we okay. shot the pilot. But it was great. It was a really great experience, and so. And I don't think I ever would have got that mm -hmm. without, without without being on oceans. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't. You know what I mean? Like, unfortunately, that's the way casting works. I mean, it's it's all luck. I just want to make this point real quick. Yeah, it's so much of it is luck. At least for me. Yeah. So much of it was luck, and once you're lucky once it makes it so much easier to be lucky the second time because I remember right before Hong, right? I would go to my auditions and do you know when you walk into a room and you just kind of know before you even start whether anyone is even really interested. Mm -hmm. And not to be unfair to casting directors at all, they're people. Yeah. And I would walk into rooms and I felt like, gosh, they're not even interested. I haven't even started. But then when I did Hum, suddenly people were thanking me. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Oh, we love this your show. And there's a certain, like a cachet, is mm -hmm. a certain kind of is, is cast around you. And you can do no wrong. And I know I wasn't a better actor, but mm -hmm. suddenly it was easier to get things simply because I was in the thing. Right. You know how that works. It's almost yeah. like um, once you get, once you date a, a popular girl, suddenly other girls will go, oh, maybe he's not so stupid after all. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it's a crude analogy. No, but yeah, I see what you're saying. But it, what I'm trying to say is that it has little to do with talent and a lot to do with luck. But also preparation, too. I mean, you know, you know, luck is I like the idea of creating your own luck, you know, but um, I feel like if you weren't prepared. It wouldn't have gone that way if you didn't. You know what I mean? If, yeah. if you didn't if you didn't have that kind of preparation um, behind it and, and like, you know, you waking up every day and, and working on your 20 monologues and that kind of thing. You know, you were you you were prepared. You've been prepared for a while, and it's yeah. that's what it's all about. It's it's all about I think preparation. And speaking of preparation, I'd like I'd be interested in knowing how when you're going into audition for something, what how do you prepare? What do you do when you get your when you get sides or or a script or whatever, and, and they ask you, can you come in and read for this or test for this? Like what what is what is that process like for you? It's excruciating for me. Tell me. Well, I'm never, I never do well if I tried to memorize my lines perfectly because, and I've done it that way, because when I go in the room, I'm all I'm thinking about is, am I getting this word perfect? Mm. And I'm also too scared to just walk in and read it. Mm. So. I'm always in this bet with myself of trying to become so familiar with the material that it's second nature so I can get to the business of acting mm -hmm. and believing the circumstances that I'm always sort of like, learn it, but don't learn it too well. Um, get that line right. Don't just paraphrase it. Mm -hmm. But now it's um, just sounds like You've lost all the life in it. Mm. So to me, it's a constant balancing act. Right. And it, it's a drag. And um, 
it just started to be fun for me after so many years, right, right before COVID, like about a year before COVID hit. What do you think was this? What was the the change for you that made it fun? That's a great question. Were you just feeling more relaxed? I was feeling more relaxed and more playful. Mm. That's what it's about. And yeah, it's about being playful. That's hard on myself. Yeah, that's key, isn't it? A lot of it had to do with my ego, John. Mm. Like that same thing that made me say no, no to people, you know? Yeah. When it was obviously not the right time to say no, was this I'm an actor with a mm. capital A, mm. which also drove me to be perfect in auditions, which made me boring. Isn't that interesting? So my own sense of self got in the way. Mm. So when I took myself less seriously, I felt like, oh my God, what a relief. I don't have to be a good actor. I just have to have fun. Yeah. It takes so long to get to that point where you can, <laughs> it's amazing. Like, cause I've been kind of feeling that way too. I'm very hard on myself and I'm sure you are too. Um, like I, I'm one of these guys that, you know, one of the tricks that I use, like when I'm trying to learn lines is I have to write it in my own handwriting and I've got to, you know, I I'm, do that. I, I mean, <laughs> I've got notebooks of me just scribbling the same shit me, me over, too. over and over again. And, um, I read recently that one of the things that, um, Anthony Hopkins does is he will read when he gets a script, he reads the script a hundred times. That's his rule. He reads it a hundred times before he even thinks about starting to, to learn the lines. Wow. So not only does he know his lines, but he's got everybody else's lines and he wow. knows every single aspect of the story. So he's never lost in it. Um, cause That's the, great. he says he just doesn't want to have to worry about, he doesn't want to have to worry about the lines. He just wants yeah. to act. Um, yeah. but you know, that's that's a that's a heavy way to work, but uh, if it works for him, it works for him. I've um, tried that way of reading the script over and over, uh -huh. and um, what I found was that I just I, my mind would just check out. Yeah, yeah. Even and just I, sides, I'm like, okay, don't go to bed till you read this three times in a row. Yeah, I would say that make a deal with myself like that, and then I would I would be breezing through it. My brain would be somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. That's why I find notebooks and writing things down is really helpful because it connects you to, it keeps you, um, it keeps you on your toes, like paying right. attention. Right. But I also, the, half the reason why I think I write it down in, you know, in my own handwriting is because I, I want to take ownership of it. Yep. I think that has a lot to do with it for me. Um, it also helps you learn the rhythm of the. Yeah. What you're reading, right? Because yeah, yeah, totally. By writing it. Yeah. Um, uh, I just lost my actors, phone. Actors are often, maybe I'm wrong about this. Do you tell me what you think, John? Yeah. I think actors are often shy. And they're often people who do respond to reading and writing. Like, yes. There's a, I don't, not like they read big books or anything, but that, if you can read something and it comes alive in your brain, mm -hmm. then you're you're not probably an actor. Yeah, you're living it. Yeah, That's just that. What do you think? No, I I agree a hundred percent. I feel that way about music. Like I get, oh. I I get lost in music completely. When I if I'm at a party or even just like a small dinner party and there's you know music playing in the background. I have a hard time focusing on conversation, if especially if it's music that I enjoy, huh. um, because I'm always I'm just keyed into to what's happening to the music. And if it's music that I hate, <laughs> it's even, and you can't have fun. It's even worse, man. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I do think that um, I, I agree. I think that if you're the kind of person that when reading a book and you're seeing it like playing out in your head so vividly, I do think that you might might be an actor. Yeah, I think so. Or if you find yourself watching and being invested in people's behavior. Oh, yeah. Do that's people, probably. Do people watch? To an unhealthy degree, yeah. 
I haven't done it in a while. That's why I love living in New York so much because you, it was just all around you all the time. In LA, you don't get that because you're always in your car. I used to, you're right. That's what I loved about Chicago. Yeah. I loved watching people. I loved sitting in busy places and um, pretending to read or pretending to write in my little notebook. Yeah. Just because you just kind of wanted, oh, I'm starting stupid conversations just to hear people talk, you know? Yeah, yeah. That was all part of the urban experience. You don't quite get in LA. Well, you know, and you know, the other thing about living in a city like New York or Chicago is like when you go into a bar, right? And you sit down, you get a beer or whatever. You, you might have like a some kind of Wall Street guy sitting on the left of you. And then you've got like some guy that works for the Department of Sanitation sitting on the right of you. Mm. And you're, you're in the mix and you're talking to those guys, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, That's invaluable. Yeah, I think so. You might say one or the other. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, when you're – there's a, there's a bit of a detachment in L.A. about that. Um, I, wish, I wish there was some way that – I don't know. You know why that is? I it's think. about, it's very tribal in LA. And not only that, but like, I want to hear about that, but I just want to say, you're not going to get in LA, the, the plumber and the wall street guy yeah. in the same bar yeah. for one thing. Yeah. You're going to go, go to a bar, throw a rock and everyone's going to be, uh, in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not LA's fault. Right. But it, it's not going to have that cross section of people. Exactly. So, what do you mean by tribal? Well, I feel like when you come to when you come to LA, it's um, it's very hard. It, at least in my experience, it was very hard for me uh, to find my tribe. There's Laura. Hey, Laura. <laughs> hey. <laughs> it, was, it was very hard for me to find my tribe, and um, and it took. It took a long, long time, and uh, and then once you find that group of people, um, it seems like it's hard to um, it, not mix with other people, but but I think it's hard to to get that kind of experience of of of, of other groups because I feel like it's very you get insulated. Yeah. in a lot of ways out here. I don't yeah. know. Do you, do you ever feel that? Well, I'm trying to figure out what you mean because... Well, I think, I think what I mean is... Um, I think every... You know, for actors, you know, a lot of people are in it for the same thing. And mm -hmm. there's also like a... There's a kind of a bit of an unhealthy competition and, and, and there's lots of egos and things involved. And, yeah. and I think it's finding... You know, when you come to L.A., you got to find like a nice community of people that you can settle with and have support of. You know what I mean? Um, unlike being in another in a big city where there's more than one industry, uh, where you can have friends that do tons of other different things. Yeah, and I think also in Chicago, anyway. I don't know about New York, but the stakes were so much lower. Mm -hmm. You know being cast in a play whether it's you or your one of your five friends it's not going to change your life right whereas in la you could get cast in a show and suddenly your best friend is living in his apartment and you're able to buy a house yeah and that disparity in you know your fate yeah. can can make it hard to to be buddies you, 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 that's not, it. I think that 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 I think that's interesting that you that you bring that up. Yeah, it turns um, you into rivals. That's the worst. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a, it's one of those awful side effects. Like, yeah. You know. Um, yeah, and maybe what it's tribal. Maybe you also mean that people of a kind, even in L.A., say actors of a certain. Well, no, that's not true. I was going to say that. Uh, movie stars, mm -hmm. they're going to hang with other movie stars. Well, I mean, because it, no one else is going to kind of they're not get having, it. they're not having the same experience as other people. Yeah, you know? and and I think that's natural because you see that happening all the time with like, oh, so and so is dating so and so now, and it's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. They run in the same circles, and and you know their lives are are they're totally you know 
But it wasn't true of any of the guys, Ocean's Eleven guys. They were all friends with people who were not. That's good. I like I like hearing that. I mean, um, more, way more. Yeah. Like I, I've met all those guys, friends on the set and, and off set. And mm. None of them were movie stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this, man. How are you dealing with um, with the, all this downtime right now? I'm writing like crazy. Writing music or writing? Well, I have a 47 song record that I want to put out that I record. That's like a quadruple album, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I recorded it. I made it easy on myself. I recorded it all on GarageBand. Sweet. And, I, um, and, and only because I knew it would be fast. So I would try to do a song, record an entire song a day. Drums, bass, uh, guitar vocals so you're programming drums and stuff no playing drums oh you're playing drums you got a kit yeah i have a kit is it, and it's and all mic'd up and and sounding good one one drum mic so you got one, one overhead mic one overhead mic uh-huh and it's really crummy it's like every i play everything at the same level what do you what, what's crummy the, your, your drumming or the quality of the sound both <laughs> i bet that's a bit i bet there's a charm to it that's what i'm hoping yeah that's what I, I'm guarantee, hoping. I guarantee it sounds cool because i'm not a musician like you i'm well i'm i'm a bass player that fiddles basically with other things <laughs> i'm not i'm not really i mean that's you're better i'm not a guitar player Nor guitar, am I. guitar drives me crazy it's too many strings i hate guitar <laughs> So anyway, I'm d I've done that, uh -huh. and uh, I'm also writing. I wrote a play for Zoom, specifically for Zoom. Oh, cool! Formed on Zoom and incorporates. It's meant to be taking place on Zoom. That Amazing! I just finished that, and uh, are you are you it. are you gonna perform it? I don't know what to do with it. I've done it. We performed it in our cl Zoom class. What Zoom I've class? In, I've been yeah. in this acting class for since i moved to la so okay let me all right l l hold on let me let me stop you there so you're still taking acting classes oh yeah yeah that and is, i always have yeah okay that that that's really really valuable and really important well because you know john it's like it's fun to act and, and if you're not gonna at least i'm gonna act at least once a week yeah and but these, what was great was we were, you know, you had that that acting class. It wasn't really a class. It was more of like a everyone getting together and just kind of doing their thing. And I, I and you invited me into that. It. Same thing, yeah. That's what it is. As yeah. Daisy just reminded me. Yeah, and you know, you uh, same class. Yeah, it was great. I loved it. And then you know, I guess you know, it ended. But um, but I found that super valuable. I loved going in and working on things that you would normally not get to work on. Yeah, I mean, don't don't get me wrong. Like as my daughter's quick to point out, it's not like I'm like training myself in various methods and stuff. Right, you're just working just, shit out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. So cool. I'm writing. They they performed it and it was great. Awesome, man. Well, I want to see it. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know if, what to do with it. it I don't know if I you... want to record it or. Oh, what. so you didn't you didn't record it. I did not record. It. Oh, okay. Well, because next time you do it, you should. I know this it. sounds crazy, but I'm really reluctant to ask these guys to learn their lines. <laughs> it's one thing to do this, uh, you know, in class where you can read it right, on screen, right? right. But I, I'm like, I'm reluctant to make people work hard. So it was more of a live for my own vanity. It was more of a live reading then. Yes. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, yeah. yeah. But I mean, they're not doing anything anyway. Might as well. <laughs> I know that's what you know. Well, some people in the class say that. Yeah. Wow. That's but good. I'll man. Let you read it if you want to read it. I'd love to. Yeah. Send right. it my way. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that. You know, you're keeping yourself busy. Um, you know, for How me. about you? Are you doing a lot of writing? You know what I've been doing? I, I've been. Um, Playing. Well, I, I've I've had this project that I've been trying to to pitch for a while, and I, I've been doing a rewrite of it, and that's kind of been what I'm doing. Um, I'll send you I'll send you a copy of the trailer so you can check it out. Could we shot a proof of concept trailer for it? Oh yeah, do send it. Yeah, I'll send it to you. And let you let you check it out. Um, and I've been uh, I've been working out a lot, and I've been watching a lot of the master classes. 
which have been really cool. Oh, tell me which ones. Okay, so I've watched so far. Um, the first one I watched was the David Lynch filmmaking one because I love David Lynch. He's my yeah, yeah, I, do I too. just love David Lynch. And uh, and then tell I me, watched. Tell me, tell me it, the tell me one thing that that you love that he said. You have to always be dreaming. Oh, that's awesome. That's so awesome. And he almost means literally. Yeah. I mean, he makes me want to cry because he's such a because he's such a pure artist. Like yeah. it's all about it's all about the art life with him, and uh, you know, and, and you know, he I think there's because I think he was a painter before he became a filmmaker, and his process with painting was, he said it would take four hours of preparation and looking at the canvas and building the canvas before he would even dip his paintbrush into any paint. He said, you need at least, he feels you need at least four hours of time before you can really get into it to clear all the shit out of your head. And plus I'm, I'm very into, uh, you know, I, I do, um, transcendental meditation. So, and he's a big proponent of that. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I got a lot of, uh, I've gotten a lot of things out of him in the, in the, you know, lately, and watching that master class was really reinforcing. It, it was very, very good. Do you know, I did a play on Broadway last year. I know. I wanted to talk to you about that because I think... I had uh, to sing. Yeah, so tell, tell, us, tell us what the play was. It was Waitress, which was um, a, a film I was in. and They asked me to play the, the role, same role, but on Broadway. And I had to sing. And I've never been comfortable with that. Mm. I have... You know, singing in a band is one thing, but right. But like singing people, in a musical theater is. It's like singing with like Olympic athletes, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. So anyway, I went to New York, and I was so nervous about that, uh, and, and, and a nervousness unlike, say, doing a movie where it just wouldn't go away day to day, yeah. because I knew this opening night for me was going to come up, and I knew that. Everything would decided be decided in one performance. Have Either I was ever, gonna have you, three months of crickets, uh -huh. or people would laugh. It, do you know what I mean? I just, yeah, yeah. Was this your first? Was, it, was this your first Broadway? Um, yes. Oh first. My God, amazing. And it was scary, and it was really scary. So I started. It must to, have been for the first time ever. I started to meditate. What kind of meditation? I would just um, sit mm -hmm. and in a comfortable position, like m mostly on the floor, mm. sometimes in a chair. Sure. And um, try to recognize when thoughts entered my consciousness mm -hmm. and try to, best I could, let them go. Yeah. So it's, like a, it's like a Vipassana Focus meditation. on my breathing. Yeah, it's a breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... So yeah, that that's kind of along the lines of like Vipassana uh, meditation. So, so you're focusing on the breathing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. I, when in I, doubt, it's focus good stuff, on your man. Breathing. It's great stuff. Were you it, using Were you using like an app or anything like that? I started off using an app and then okay. just started doing it myself. Cool. But the thing is, John, it it it, it was the trick. It was the, it was it helped me out. How, how many times a day were you doing it? Twice a day. Twice a day. Yeah. So like what in the morning and then later on in the afternoon? Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I went to every rehearsal and before wow. I went to bed. So it puts you it put you right in the in in the zone to be able to to get through it all. Yeah. Wow. It helped me it helped me not think beyond just what was before me. Yeah. Because everything and, else if I thought other than what was right then and right there, yeah. I would just I would just get scared. And the play was a big success, right? Mm -hmm, it was. Man, that must have been just such an amazing feeling that you know. Oh, so that you're, that you're in a in a in a Broadway hit musical. That's like was, that's incredible. Bliss. Yeah. It was bliss, like being on stage like that. Yeah, electric. It was, it was just bliss, I gotta say. Man. But off stage, it was miserable. Was it? Yeah. Because you're was. away from your family, or or what? Yeah, that, 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 mostly that. Mm. Being alone in New York City, Oof. my age, you know, it was yeah. fun. 
and I couldn't do anything fun. Like right. because I was you're working all the time. I couldn't drink like I wanted to. <laughs> I couldn't do any crack. No, you had to be an athlete, like you said, man. Especially yeah. when you, would you do? Uh, did you do like two performances um, a day? Uh, in some like eight, places? eight, a, eight a week. So okay. yeah, yeah. So what were, what were we talking about though? We were off the. Subject. We were talking about master class, and, and we. Oh, I, right. I, and I, I was okay, telling you so about. I was talking about David Lynch and, and meditation yeah, yeah, yeah. dreaming and dreaming, you know, dreaming out loud and, and always be dreaming um, and meditating that, and meditating. Yeah. That's what I got out of his. And then I watched, kind of, I wa can I ask what kind of meditating you do? Sorry. I do transcendental meditation. It's so the, tell me it's, what's that? It's the same. It's, uh, it's, that's what David Lynch does. Right? It's what David Lynch does. It's also what the Beatles did. Um, you know they were it's it's the maharishi is, is focus the man. on a mantra yeah you focus on a mantra and um it's like 20 minutes uh twice a day i i've i've kind of fallen off the wagon a little bit i want to get back on it but um you know i'd like to get back to doing it twice a day uh and i will it's just a matter of me just you know sitting down and finding quiet time isn't that crazy how it, difficult it is well yeah it's hard when you know you're in the lockdown, so when, especially when you're in lockdown and, and you know you've you, you know you got uh two dogs and and you know my daughter and 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 claire and we're all on top of each other all the time part um, of my problem was with the one i would do it it would it would just starting it would would infuse panic into my consciousness yeah I'd think about things like, mm -hmm. you know, death and mm -hmm. beyond. And yeah. that would really like would make me very uncomfortable. But, but that was, that's part of it because those things, those part things are bubbling up and you got to let them come up and you got to let them just, like you said, you got to let it just drift away. Um, yeah. So I, it's to me, it's inc probably learning how to do meditation was probably the, one of the best things I've ever learned in my life most one of the most valuable tools ever i highly recommend it um i get a lot of have you ever it. tried heroin john uh no i have not <laughs> <I've done. laughs> um i I've, imagine they would I've, 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 I've done pretty much everything else but that <laughs> yeah <laughs> me too and but i imagine that's what all in moderation my friend all heroin moderation. would kind of give you Oh, well, are you talking about the effect of it? Heroin. Yeah. 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 Well, when get... you hear about what heroin does to people, mm. um, it, and it makes me really curious, like what that is. Mm -hmm. I feel like, oh, well, meditation kind of can do that. It's just getting lost or even getting lost in writing or acting. Just well, being in the present. Yeah. It, all the pressure is removed and suddenly... Yeah. You get that warm, cozy feeling that you hear. Yeah. You know, on stages like that. Well, I think that's why. It, I think that's why it's about a, a, like a lot of recovering addicts turn to meditation. And it's been and it's been very um, well documented that um, meditation is highly effective with people with PTSD. Um, and like the the military is now like really on board with with uh, with meditation and and. And, you know, you look at every sports team now, every sports team now has a meditation guru kind of, you know, uh, really? oh yeah, man, you know, all the, and all these high performance athletes and high performing, you know, uh, Silicon Valley CEOs and all, they all swear by it. So there's, you know, there's something to it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah, man, I'm glad to hear that you're doing that. That's so good. tell me more about what. Tell me more about. No, I have to get back on it. I I quit as soon as I got home. No, we sh you should start up again. I should. Yeah, man. I mean, go you back know. to your classes. You oh, so then uh, as far as master class goes, I watched. Let's see, I, I watched David Lynch, and then right after that, I watched. Um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Natalie Portman's uh, acting. Um, master class oh, and I, didn't I know she had one and i thought i was like you know what i'm just gonna watch this and see see what's going on here and i was sh really pleasant not i've always thought she's an amazing actor i agree but i, I was very um it, the way she approaches things is very very uh interesting and in-depth and um just very layered she's she is has a really really great way of approaching things and 
Give me an idea. Like, well, I think, I think, you know, that? with her, like she's been in front of the camera since she was, you know, since I guess the professional, I think was her first film. Right. Mm. So she's had years and years and years in front of the camera and she's just picked up on things that, um, that are very interesting. She did this. There's one bit in there where she's talking about how she'll ask the director or the, the camera operator to just follow her around the room and let her just kind of see the things that are in the room. And then she'll ask the property uh, managers um, if they will, uh, you know, can I, can I, can I break this glass or can I, can I, can I like take this thing and move it over here? And, and just so that she's always having something kind of physical to do in the space and, mm. and the way she takes in space. That's just like a one small kind of example of. That's a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of luxury. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's almost like a private yeah. moment kind of exercise or like, you know, being in your own apartment, like, you know, you're walking on set and it's like a set designed apartment and it's supposed to be yours. And like she would ask if she could bring things of her own into, you know, into the, into the mix so that, it felt more like her kind of space. And I just thought that was just, you know, that's, that's a really great thing. Cause that reminded me of all the acting exercises I used to do in class. Totally. Um, just but, getting um, comfortable in the space is like such a big deal. Yeah. And then after, after I watched hers, I watched, um, Sam Jackson's class, which was another one that was like really eye opening. He's got a really unique approach to things. And then What's I watched, his? his is just, um, you know, I heard that he never says the words out loud until he approaches every single part differently. Basically, is kind of how he goes about it. He's heavy and oh. he's heavy into research. He researches the hell out of things, and oh, that's cool. And like you know, really submerges you know gets himself submerged into the work. Um, and then I watched the Martin Scorsese uh, one, which is good. I'm watching the Ron Howard one, which is pretty good right now too. It's just neat, like seeing these things and. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know if they, they still have the deal now, but Masterclass had this deal where you can do like a subscription and then you could, if you buy one subscription, you get to give it to a friend. Yeah. Also, I don't know if they're still doing that or not, but um, we ended up doing that with a friend of ours and who's a writer. She's, you know, really into, you know, the Neil Gaiman Masterclass and all that. Mm -hmm. But it's been keeping me busy doing that. And I've been writing some music and, and um, trying to, just trying to stay sane. I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. I have not, this is, and I'm, I'm, I've been struggling with all this. I just turned 50 and I was kind of expecting, you know, when I turned 50, that it would be a little bit of a lighter kind of atmosphere. <laughs> and, and, and I thought I'd have that is amazing. You do not look even close to fifty. I know. I don't. I don't feel fifty. That's the other thing. But I was. I think I. I it was a bit of a letdown because I was. I was hoping I could be around people on my birthday and. Yeah. And. Uh, but I. You know. I. I'm the kind of guy. I don't like being, like, stuck in one place for too long. I like to move around, and I like to constantly be working, and. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm having, I've been having a hard time with it. So maybe if I get back on my meditation, I, maybe that'll help. I hope. Yeah. To be honest, me too. I've been going a little crazy. Yeah. Well, listen, man, you know, um, I'm all about, you know, if, if you need to reach out, I'm always there and uh, accountability and all that. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to keep the conversation going with you, man. Um, Send me your, I'd love to see the, uh, the, the trailer? the trailer? Yeah, yeah, I'll send yeah. it to you. I'll send it to you and let you check it out. So listen, man, we've been going for a while now. We should probably, yeah. we should probably wrap this up. Um, Let's do it. There's so much more we could have talked about. Maybe we can do a part two sometime soon. I'd um, love to. I mean, that would be fantastic. I yeah, feel like I mean, we just started. Yeah, I know, right? It just kind of flies by. But um, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Eddie Jamison, uh, where can we find you? Where can people find you? In my home. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> just We're, knock, just, just knock, put on a mask. Do you have social media? Do you, do you pursue that? I'm, I'm really not on any social media. Okay. What about your music? Where can oh. people? Oh, um, uh, music. I haven't yet to put this thing out, okay. but you know, if you want to listen to anything, I'm in a band right now called the light jackets, which you can find on Apple music and Spotify. Cool. And I'll be putting out um, 
my 47 song record <laughs> under the name Eddie Jemison. Amazing. The crazy prices. That's amazing. Man. A, I, I, I invented a fake band called the crazy prices. So cool. you can find it under either that or Eddie Jemison. Awesome. But, awesome. But and, wait a uh, and we'll uh, we'll look out for you and uh, and all the, the the things that are going on. Do you, is there anything that you that you've done recently that's that's coming out that we should be that we should know about? No, no. But you know, if I may, can I plug one thing? Yeah, I made a film a few many. Oh years yeah, ago. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I completely called King of Herring. I know. I'm sorry. We and completely forgot about this. Let's no, talk about it's this. Okay. Yeah. But that, I think it's on Amazon mm -hmm. at um, KingofHerrings.com. Or rather, King of Herrings is the mm -hmm. movie. King of Herrings. Like and I finish. saw it. I went to the premiere in... Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah I, at was the, at, I was there. The Chinese was, theater. Yeah, at the Chinese theater. And uh, it's an amazing film. It reminded Thanks. me of like a Jim Jarmusch film. Who I love. Yeah, it had that kind of vibe to it. I loved it. And you're fantastic in it. And what's... Thank you. The, I want to talk about this for now because it's all firing in my head right now, if, if you don't mind. Thanks. No, God, not. Anything. The the character that you play in that film is not like who you are in real life at all, which... Right. I, that's a... He's a dark character. And, yeah. And violent. Yeah. And, uh, I, and I was not prepared for that going in i i i didn't <laughs> I was not prepared at all but i thought it was so great and it just it's just a testament to you man i think you're just such a great actor and you've got such oh, an amazing God, john thank amazing you amazing range um but uh what was that experience like because you produced the film as well right yeah um i, I wanted to make a film for for my acting pals hmm. And, 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 you know, unlike, you know, unlike, say, uh, these other people you mentioned, like David Lynch, who waits four hours before he jumps into something, mm. I, I, well, I'm the opposite. I, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to write something. Mm -hmm. So I wrote something for this class to perform. And then I went back to New Orleans to film it because that's where I'm from. And, and all these actors that I met that have worked with Soderbergh that are still mm. up careers. Like John Mies and all those guys? John Meese, mm -hmm. David Jensen, Joe Crest, mm -hmm. all these, Wayne Prey, mm -hmm. these great actors I worked with. I wanted us to do a film together, so I wrote parts for them all. And we switched characters, mm -hmm. and somehow I ended up as the, the guy you mentioned, Dick. So great. The violent kind yeah. of nut, nut job who ruins his wife's life. Mm -hmm. life's, wife's life, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Laura, my wife, uh, is in it, and she's she, the best thing about it. She steals the show. She, she really is does. So great in it. The camera she loves so her. Talented, yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, beautiful. amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know. It was and so we can I find that. Into. We can find that on iTunes and 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 Amazon. Yeah. iTunes, Amazon. Awesome. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'll put that in the show notes. So I'll make sure everybody sees it. Thank um, you. I really no, you got it, man. Well, so what? Well, what did you find was the hardest thing about producing that? Selling it, like making it, writing it was a blast. Mm -hmm. Making it was fun. How'd you raise the money? Um, I did a Kickstarter campaign. Cool. And I think I raised about half of it that way. Okay. And then I, I put in the rest of myself. Mm. It wasn't much. I think we did the whole thing for like $20,000. That's it? Yeah. I got a lot of help from friends for free. Uh -huh. um, anyway, the hardest part was once it was done, was just getting people to watch it. Getting people to I watch mean, it. Yeah. It's weird. Like you can give people, I found, you can give people a script and say, hey, read this. I'm going to maybe produce this. And people will read it in a day. Yeah. But you give them something to watch, which is actually easier. Yeah. People don't do it. And I think it's because it's already done so they can't invest themselves in it or maybe yeah maybe you're right there i don't know why i've been trying to figure that out for how's, years it, how's, how's it been doing though i mean as, as i don't it... know i just got like a little check for it the other day no it's great <laughs> it's, it's still people still watch it cool cool you know well i'll make sure you know. my people i'll make sure my fans my uh, my audience watches it thank you yeah, it's not yeah. the easiest film to watch you know no, but it's a good one it's a damn black good and white one. it's a character study yeah it's weird yeah but i think it, 
I don't know. I like it. I dig it. I thought it was great. Thank you, John. Yeah. All right, man. Well, let's wrap it up here. We're, send, uh, me that, send me that trailer. I will, for sure. Eddie, thank you for coming on. Thanks so much. Let's do part two, and let's talk about completely different stuff. You got it, man. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, go ahead and hit subscribe. Also, give me a follow on Instagram at J-O-H-N-J-T-A-G-U-E and on Twitter, same handle, at J-O-H-N-J-T-A-G-U-E. See you next time.